we can begin now. Yeah. I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to another session in this series, Bay Area Computer History Perspectives. And so far, the series has been organized mostly by myself. I'm Peter Nerksy from Sun Microsystems, and also Jeannie Trichel. Jeannie, if you could stand up so people know who you are, also from Sun. But we're interested in expanding, perhaps, the organization of the series to include more people interested in history, get more ideas for programs. So if you're interested in contributing to this series, please talk with either Jeannie or myself. And this evening, we're going to be going back over 30 years to 1963. And we've been there a couple times before, that particular year in this program, in this series. Our first program in the computer history series was Computing at Livermore in 1963. And back then, the total core memory of all the computers at Livermore was the total two megabytes. Right. Takes you back quite a ways. And we were also back then in 1962-63 in our last program on the history of the ARPANET. That was back 1962 when Paul Buran started his research on packet switching at RAND. And the packet switching later became the foundation for the ARPANET. And this evening we're going back again to 1963 when a young graduate student at MIT had just finished his thesis, Sketchpad, on interactive graphics. And we have him here with us tonight, Ivan Sutherland. Thank you very much, Ivan, for speaking in our series. In 1993, I don't do ties, but in 1963, I did, so for the occasion. <laughs> is that okay where the microphone is? I put it just under my tie. Is that better? Okay. Just so everyone got to the right place. There are some caveats that you should read here. It's all my fault if it's wrong. If I mistreat anybody, you complain to me and not to the management. And in case you can't read fine print, this lecture and all recordings of it are the property of the author. Use of any portion of this material for profit-seeking purposes, including resale, rental for a fee, replay at events where admission is charged, or any use for broadcast or cable TV, requires my advance permission. In 1963, I had two children. They were one and three. And I'd like to dedicate this lecture to my wife of that time, Marcia Sutherland. And uh, Marcia, on many, many occasions, got up at three in the morning and gave me some breakfast and sent me off to use the TX2. I got it only in the wee hours of the night when nobody else wanted it. And uh, so that explains why the hour was there. What I've never been able to explain was why she never complained about doing that and then managed to get through the day the next day with the kids. I always like to have an outline of my talk so you can see what's coming, and I put that up in front so I can remember what I'm supposed to talk about, and uh, that works out pretty well. So there's five parts to this. It's a little historical perspective of what was it like in 1963, what had happened. Before I go into that, who here was not born in 1963? I'd like to see a show of hands. <laughs> you were born in 62. <laughs> so there's a fair number of folk for whom this is ancient history. And uh, I was pleased to see some old friends. Uh, there's a Livermore contingent up here. I think there's some Apple folk here. How many of you are from Utah? Can I see hands from the Utah crowd? OK. So there's a bunch. OK. So for historical background, here's what we had. About 1951, my older brother Bert and I went down to the uh, Bell Telephone Laboratories and visited a man by the name of Claude Shannon. Now, for those of you who may not have heard that name, you certainly heard of BITS 
Claude Shannon is the man who named them. He was a wonderful man. He later on became my thesis supervisor, but we went to visit him in 1951, an event which he remembered when I went back to see him about 1960 at MIT. And uh, I think it may be the fact that I had visited him when I was in junior high school that uh, encouraged him to, in fact, take me on as a, as a thesis student. To my knowledge, he had exactly three PhD students in his entire teaching career at MIT. Uh, two of them were Sutherlands, and the other one is a Swiss fellow who, of whom I've lost track. The first computer program I ever wrote was in 1953, was for a desktop machine called Simon. Now, Simon was a relay machine which had 12 bits of storage. <laughs> it had six two-bit words. And that meant it could add numbers from 0 to 3 to other numbers from 0 to 3. And by dint of doing double precision arithmetic, it could add all the way up to 16, 15, I guess. Uh, I made Simon divide, which was a major tour de force, especially considering it had no conditionals. The transistor radio appeared in August 1955, just as I was graduating from high school, Sputnik in 57. The digital equipment company split off from MIT and was founded in 1958. I finished my a uh, bachelor's degree in 59 and a master's from Caltech in 1960. And there was a very significant thing in my life which happened in 1960, which is Marvin Minsky and Oliver Selfridge came to visit Caltech. And I had dinner in the Athenaeum at Caltech, and these two guys regaled me with stories of computers at MIT. And at that time, computing at Caltech was not in very good shape, but computing at MIT was alive and well, and I said, I've got to get a piece of this. And so I left Caltech and went to MIT to do a PhD. I went, to, as soon as I arrived at, at MIT, I went to Claude Shannon's house for a visit. He never came into school. He was, uh, you know, he was the Donner professor, I guess, and he had done so many important things that they just wanted him there. He never came to the college, so you had to go to his house to see him. So I went out to Winchester and visited him at his house, and he produced some photographs that I had sent him back in. 1951 or something, and remembered the, remembered the incident that my wife was pregnant at the time, and his wife fixed her up with, you know, sterilizing equipment for baby bottles and racks to hang diapers on and stuff. They were really wonderful to us. Uh, man didn't get in space until a few years later, so that gives you a little context of what the world was like then. TX2 was the machine that I used for this. It had been built at Lincoln Laboratory. And I'll say a little bit about TX2. It was a wonderful machine, a one of a kind. It was essentially the prototype for what later on became DEX PDP-6, which then was later the PDP-10 and following that the DEX-20. Uh, it, it was a very large machine. It filled a substantial room, probably a room half the size of this one, was filled with this machine. Uh, it was one of the first transistorized machines and in fact was built to, to show that you could in fact build a machine of that sort. It lasted for quite a long time and I went to a wonderful wake when it was finally shut down 20 years after it started. And so, uh, rest in peace. Here's a picture of the console of the TX2 and uh, that photograph demonstrates that at one time I did have hair. <laughs> and. Uh, I think when I finished graduate school, I was about two-thirds the weight that I am now. And uh, you'll see me also I appear in the movie. There were a variety of input-output devices on TX2. One of them was this plotter. And many of the pictures which I'm going to show you today were made with the sketchpad system. And you'll see that they were plotted on this plotter. You can recognize them pretty easily. Some of the other slides were made on <coughs> my portable Macintosh. And I'll just use that as a contrast for the specifications. The TX2 was a twelfth of a MIP. Now, would somebody like to comment on what, what's a good number of MIPs for a reasonable portable machine today? A dozen, maybe? And it had a third of a megabyte of storage. So it was not, you know, not overly equipped. And then it had a backing store, which was eight megabytes of addressable mag tape. The display on it, Raster displays, as you see on computers today, were unheard of in that day. There was a scope on this thing which could, in fact, plot a single point. So under 
can program control, you could say plot a point at a certain x, y coordinate, and it would do that for you. There was a light pen that you could use for input, and I'll say a little bit more about how that works in a minute or two. It had uh, a thing that looked kind of like a typewriter. It was called the Lincoln Writer. And then it had uh, a whole bank of switches. And in fact, if I go back to the console here, you can see those. These here are toggle switches, which represented 16 words of memory. And the words were 30, 36 bits plus an extra bit. So there were 592 little toggle switches there that you could uh, flip to fix, you know, put whatever you wanted in. And that was actually addressable as a piece of memory. And if the machine broke and you thought the machine was not working, the repairman virtually wouldn't fix it unless you could put a program in toggle memory that would fail. And so there was always the, the art of, you know, if the machine doesn't seem to be working, could I write something in 16 instructions or less that would prove that it didn't work so I could persuade the, the repair guy to come and fix it? Oh, it was a wonderful old machine. Larry Roberts uh, was a prominent uh, user of TX2, and the Bell Telephone Laboratories folk made this wonderful tone that goes up forever. You know, it, it's a series of 12 tones, each of which appears to be higher in pitch than the previous one. But when you get through the 12th tone, you're back to where you started. And there's a trick to how the harmonics come in and out, which makes it possible to do that. And I, I once told Larry about this. I hadn't heard the tone what I had heard of them, and I told Larry about it. He says, I can program that. And so he programmed up it as a siren. And TX2, of course, had speakers on it and a microphone, but it had these speakers on it. And he, he programmed this thing up as a siren. So the siren would continually increase in pitch, and it would go on octave after octave after octave after octave after octave, going up in pitch. And when he started playing this, the guards always came down to find out whether there was a fire or something else going on. A little technical detail of TX2. It was a fixed point machine. It could add and subtract, multiply and divide. But it also had part word operations. It was a 36-bit machine, and you could divide the 36-bit word into two 18-bit halves or into four 9-bit quarters. So in one operation, it could do four adds if they were only 9 bits long, or four multiplies or four divides, and so on. It had a bit setting and clearing and testing operation, which was addressable to the bit. So you could touch any single bit in memory. It had 64 index registers, of which, eight, of which 32 served also as program counters. It was a multi-sequence machine, which meant that when I.O. was required, it simply did a very quick um, change to using another program counter and did whatever I.O. operation was to be done. I believe the Alto at, at Xerox Park was similarly endowed. Uh, it was a, it was a quite a clever way to do I.O. in those days when there were no, no channels. You could basically program up the channel of your, of your choice. You had to allocate the other registers rather carefully so that the I.O. operation didn't disturb the state of the main computing operation. The main computing operation, of course, had the lowest priority. Now, whenever we talk about, uh, whenever we talk about a machine, we always have to talk about what the operating system was. I mean, you either use, you know, the DOS or System 7 if you're a Mac, or you use Solaris if you happen to be a Sun guy. And the operating system is very important. We had an absolutely terrific operating system on TX2. <laughs> you had to roll your own. Okay, and a compiler? Well, no, compiler, Schmiler. We had this wonderful macro assembler that Larry Roberts wrote. I think Larry was here maybe last time talking about ARPANET. And uh, one of the things he did, especially for my work, which was extremely valuable for pointer following, was he put a special notation in the assembler to make use of a facility that TX2 had to allow you to load an index register from, a, from a, another index register pointer. So basically, you could do an index load index operation, which was what I used for pointer following. There was a lot of pointer following done in Sketchpad. Let me talk a little bit about the light pen. Here's a photograph of the light pen that I used, and also a, a drawing which shows what's inside. Inside the light pen, there's a lens and a photocell, so that the light pen can see the dots that appear on the, on the face of the screen. And after each dot was displayed, the light pen would either respond or not, providing an interrupt to the machine saying, I saw that dot. 
Now, by a suitable program, and this was, in fact, a piece of program which ran in one of the I.O. sequences, I could make a little servo mechanism which would cause a tracking cross to follow the motion of the light pen around. So what appeared on the screen was an image of this sort, a little cross, maybe logarithmic or maybe just a cross or maybe three legs. I experimented with a bunch of different ones. And in the movie that I'll show later on, you will see my hand moving the light pen, and you will see this little cross of light, which is, in effect, the point of the pencil. And what you have to remember is that there's a piece of glass between what I'm holding in my hand and that cross of light. And it will appear that what I'm holding is a flashlight, and the light is shining out of the flashlight onto the screen. But that's not what's happening. The light is shining into the photocell. And the computer is moving the little cross quickly enough to keep track of where the, uh, where the hand is moving. Now, the light pen was actually used for two things. It was used for tracking in order to keep track of where, the, uh, where, where information was being entered. It served the role of the mouse in that regard. But it was also used to pick up light from material that had already been drawn on the screen. So if there was a line on the screen, the dot, individual dots in the line would all be seen by the light pen. And it would say, I saw that last dot. Now, in order to store the coordinates of a dot on the screen required only 20 bits, 10 bits for each of the x and y coordinates, which left uh, another 16 bits left over. And I used those 16 bits to name each and every point that was to be dip displayed on the screen. So when the light pen saw one, I got a 16-bit number back, which would say where in the main data storage structure of the drawing that piece of light had come from, who was responsible for putting that particular dot on the screen. And that was very useful when pointing to objects to identify which object was pointed to. That was uh, the scheme that I used then. Nowadays, of course, you have to do a geometric computation to say, oh, the guy just clicked his mouse at such and such a place. And the computer sort of has to scratch its head and say, of all of the things that are on the screen, which one was it that he was actually trying to point at? And I was able to avoid that kind of computation for which the TX2 wasn't powerful enough by use, using, the, uh, using the other feature of the light pen. Now, a graphical user interface had not yet been named. GUI was unknown, OK? And so there was a clean slate. I could do anything, and it was brand new. The TX2 had, in fact, been used by Hirsch Loomis, who last I heard of was at Davis. Is he still there? Do you know? Uh, Hirsch Loomis had done a little graphical program, which is essentially Etch-a-Sketch on TX2. And there were some knobs that you could turn. As you turned the knobs, a dot of light moved around on the screen and left the trail behind. It was terrible. You couldn't draw with it at all. It demonstrated just how bad Etch-a-Sketch can be in terms of art artistic use. Uh, but aside from that, there was really not very much had been done in terms of graphical user interface. So it was all kind of brand new, and it was, a, it was a lot of fun exploring what the possibilities were. So first of all, I had a thing that I called the display file, which was half of the TX2's memory was devoted to storing all the points that were going to appear on the screen. And uh, the lines, individual lines and circles were drawn by computing carefully and elaborately all of the points in the line using some kind of a difference equation uh, algorithm. And the circles were harder. I remember the day I went in to see Claude Shannon, and I had done lines and you know got some stuff going on the screen. He said, gee, he said, I think you ought to do circles. And I remember saying some four-letter expletive to myself. I naturally didn't say it to him. But circles were hard. And what was really hard about circles was that I had to do clipping for circles. Clipping hadn't been named yet either, OK? And so I had to do it. I was clear that you had to get rid of things that were off the edge of the screen, but nobody had done that. And so clipping hadn't yet been named. It was two or three years later that Bob Sproul and I did some work at Harvard and actually named clipping. But uh, it, we did it. I did it in, in uh, Sketchpad. And a circle, you see, has a beginning and an end. And so it's possible to draw a circle on the screen in such a way that five pieces of it show a little piece of the arc, and then it disappears, and then a corner shows, and it disappears, and another corner shows, and it disappears, another corner shows, and it disappears, and then finally a little piece is left over. So I had to make this algorithm that would figure out how many parts of the circle were on the screen, and so it was a, it was a terrible nuisance. But Shannon said, I think we ought to do circles, so we did circles.
I talked about the light pen being used in two different ways. And uh, the language that I evolved, and it really was evolved, because I tried a lot of different things to see what felt good and what didn't felt good, had some features which have lasted uh, till this day. One of them was the notion of rubber band lines. You'll see that in the movie. The idea was you could go to some place on the screen and drop a little anchor, which was the end point of your line. And then as you moved the light pen around, it didn't matter what path the light pen went on. The line was always a straight line between where you dropped its end and wherever the light pen was now. And when you, when you got the line to where you wanted it, you could terminate the, the drawing operation, and that would drop and fasten the other end of the line down there. I used a flick of the pen. It turns out if you moved the pen too fast, the pen tracking routine would die. And so I used that as the termination signal. So you'd start by pushing a button, and then you'd move in a you know, it's nice smooth gesture. And when you're finished, you'd flick the pen. And you'll see that also in the movie. And I also used a thing that, that I, oh, so here's, uh, here's a picture. This is actually a sketchpad output drawing. You can see it's just a little crude. OK. Uh, here's, here's the uh, rubber band line notion uh, described. And a circle was a similar deal. You dropped the start point of the circle in the center of the circle with two button pushes. And then wherever you moved the pen, you got that much of an arc around to a place which is a straight line between where the pen is and the center of the circle. I, uh, I did a thing that I called pseudo-gravity, which said that around lines or around the intersection between lines, the, <laughs> the light pen would pick up light from those lines, and then the computer would do a computation saying, gee, the position of the light pen now is pretty close to the end of this line. I think what the guy wants is to be exactly at the end point of this line. And so what would happen is, as you move the pen near to the end of an existing part or near to an existing line, it would jump and be exactly com with the right computed coordinates. And I also used that to, to construct the topology of the drawing. So if you terminated one line on the end point of another line, you got not just a line which terminated at the same place, but actually in the computer storage, it terminated on the very same endpoint. So if you subsequently move that endpoint, both of the lines would stay attached together and attached to it. Uh, I noticed that Adobe Illustrator, for example, has the same feature in it, and it's as convenient to use now as it was then. There was scaling built into Sketchpad. Uh, we had only a seven-inch screen, and I was able to use the 18. I used 18-bit, or uh, I guess I actually used 36-bit internal yeah. coordinates. Sure. Um, <coughs> I used 36-bit internal coordinates, so there was plenty of area to work on. I think with the maximum scale factor, there was four acres or something of drawing was available, of which you saw a seven-inch portion. And you'll see in the movie, you'll see some of that magnification going on. Of course, that's pretty straightforward. Everybody does that today. But at that time, people said, gee whiz, that's, you know, didn't know that you could do that with computers. OK, now, I, there were several graphical types. There were a number of graphical types that were uh, defined. And here they, here they are. Put that up where you can't see that. That's fine. I'm sorry, text on the ceiling is fine? OK, you can have that up in the center. I you like that up there. OK, so you could have a, uh, you have a point which had an x coordinate and a y coordinate. It was strictly two-dimensional, so it had two numbers, basically. A line had no position of its own. Rather, it contained pointers to two endpoints. So in order to have a line at all, you had to have some endpoints. A circle had pointers to three endpoints, and it found its radius by the, diff the distance between the first two of those. And it used the third one only to s decide how much of an arc to draw and not for any other purpose. Out of points, lines, and circles, you could, uh, you could make, uh, I guess another thing you could make was an instance, which was a, a representation of a complete picture. And the picture, as I've mentioned down here, could be any collection of these other things. Sir? What word? The word instance does, in fact, appear in the document. I brought 
I brought the original edition of the document here. This is copy number 49. And uh, the original document, don't accept any substitutes, can be recognized as the original because it has two pages, 106, due to a, some kind of a goof in terms of, of writing it up. It was also subsequently published as a Lincoln Laboratory report, of which I have a copy here also. If anybody wants to glance at these afterwards, you're welcome to do so. But yes, the word instance does appear in the, in the document. Is that, it, was that the question? And you were the first one to use it. I, hey. I don't know that. Uh, it, seemed, it seemed it would be nice to be able to annotate the drawings. And when I decided that I was going to do all the drawings in the thesis on the system, I had to put the text and the figure numbers and so on. So I had to make some of this text. And I did that simply by writing some programs that used pieces of circles and pieces of straight lines to construct the letters. But that was a piece of program that constructed the letters. Those letters weren't pictures in any, in any real sense. And what was perhaps was more interesting was something that I called digits. And digits basically were a little piece of numerical text that had four numbers to say where they were in x and y position and what rotation and scaling they should have. And then a pointer to a scalar value, which was the value that the digits would display. So if the scalar value was the value 283, then 283 would be what the digits would say. So that permitted you to do some computations and display the results of computations. And we'll see some examples of that. Uh, a picture was a collection of any of the above. And then an instance, of course, was just a representation of a picture made in a scale and rotation somewhere, uh, somewhere on the screen. Now, to go back in history, today, of course, I talk about pointers as if it was a straightforward and, and easy kind of notion. But in, in those days, pointers were relatively rare. It was kind of a new idea. Lisp had only been around for two or three years. In fact, McCarthy himself was still teaching it at MIT. I took the course from the man himself. And uh, we argued for hours about how stacks worked. I can, I can remember the notion of a stack scratching my head and arguing with the other graduate students as whether that was really a plausible thing or not. <laughs> and of course, now it's you know, just absolutely routine. The word structures hadn't, hadn't yet entered the vocabulary. And uh, so what I, what I basically did was to use a, a format in which sets of objects were tied together by a ring structure, which had, in today's parlance, pointers to next sibling, previous sibling, and to parent as the basic entity. I chose that because it made insertion and deletion rather simple. It made, uh, it made searching rather simple. But it was not very conservative of storage. And storage was something that was in short supply in those days. Surprisingly, although we have a lot more, it still seems to be in short supply today. <laughs> so here's the kind of representation that there was for points and lines. You see the point has a little block of storage that represents all the information about a point. And it has, among other things, an x and y coordinate. And so here's two points, a and b. And then a line had some kind of a pointer. It mentioned the address of the block that represented the points. That seemed like the obvious thing to do at the time. I, uh, I described the elements of my ring structure as hens and chickens, a, note, a uh, nomenclature which has thankfully died out. <laughs> but you see, here's a pointer to next sibling in each case and a pointer to a pointer, I guess somewhere here, there's a pointer back to the, to the original element. OK. Now, there are those who argue that there was some object orientation in Sketchpad. I think Alan Kay is the principal proponent of this view. And uh, I can suggest some things uh, that might have led him to that conclusion. One of them was that there was, in fact, a master object, which I called the universe, which was the object to which all other objects belong. And then there was an object which represented the class of all displayable objects.
it was one of the objects in the universe. And, and sub-objects to it were lines, circles, pictures, and so on. And one of the obvious things, it seemed to me, to do was I had all this code that had to go around a picture and display all of the things that were in the picture. So if a thing was a displayable object, at some offset in its little block of storage was a pointer to its display subroutine, whatever that was. So the routine that went around and displayed a picture simply went to the next object in the picture and then called whatever routine appeared at offset six, let's say, which would cause that object to be displayed. Okay, now, if that seems a little familiar to what goes on inside C++, the resemblance is quite striking. Now, object orientation hadn't been named. We didn't, you know, I didn't know that's what I was doing. But it was sort of the nearest thing that one could do to that, given that there was only an assembler to do it with. And the reason for doing it then was it simply made the programming easier. I guess maybe that's the reason for doing it now, isn't it? <laughs> No, I did not call them classes. The word class does not appear in this document at all. And so Alan, I, Alan Kay called it class class. I called them objects. Here's a hierarchy of the objects that were in there. So here's the displayable things that have various, uh, various kinds of variables in them and so on. Here's what a Here's what a typical block looked like. And here, for example, is the display subroutine entry. Was it a particular position in the block where it was handy to be called? But Sir? Just to clarify, all of these pictures are zero. These were made by taking one of these documents apart and putting it into a Xerox machine. So yes, that's right. These, these pictures, well, there's two kinds of pictures, right? This kind was made on a Macintosh today. This kind was made on a TX2 31 years ago. I think you can tell the difference. <laughs> OK. <coughs> now, there was an idea in Sketchpad, which it took a long time for other folk to, to uh, work hard on. And one of the ideas that was floating around was it would be nice to be able to do programming without having to do programming. And people called this by various names, implicit programming and one thing and another. And the crack that I took at it was to try and do something that I called constraints. And the idea was that you draw the drawing first and then fix it up later. So let's see, I think I have a slide that says that somewhere. Did you distract me? Yes. Lost my. So the idea was to draw the drawing first and then fix it up. And because all of the lines rested on endpoints, if you change the coordinates of the endpoints, the topology of the drawing would stay constant. But you could move the drawing around and kind of adjust the dimensions to suit. And I thought it'd be nice if we could say things about the way the drawing ought to look. For example, you should be able to say, these two lines ought to be parallel. These two lines ought to be the same length, and so on. And I expressed those ideas as constraints. Now, constraints had an appearance. You could look at the constraints on the screen. So here, for example, is what you might do to make a parallelogram. Parallelogram, you will remember, is supposed to have two opposite edges which are the same length and parallel. And so here are two constraints represented. P is the parallel constraint, and equals is the equal length constraint. And the little dotted lines say which points they apply to. And if I take those constraints and apply them to this quadrilateral, which isn't a parallelogram, okay, and attach them together, and then turn on a switch, one of those 562 switches, which said, do the constraint thing, I would turn on the do the constraint thing, and bingo, it would turn into a parallelogram. Okay, so I had a whole bunch of different kinds of constraints. Here was the parallel one. I forget C was. C was the circle constraint. It said the distance from there to there is supposed to be the same as the distance from there to there. H was horizontal, and there was you know all these different things. Sometimes they got a little hard to read. Here's some digits, and 
putting constraints on digits was tricky because there's two different things to constrain. One is where do the digits appear on the picture? And the other is what do the digits say? And these are two quite different things. And so here's a constraint on where the digits appear, and here's a constraint on the number, the scalar value that's being represented by the digits. Here's three sets of digits displaying the same value, and by a you know, peculiar stroke, they are, in fact, displaying the same value. Sketchpad was entirely two-dimensional. There was not a three-dimensional atom in the whole thing. That didn't come for another few years. Yes, text and digits were scalable. Here's a couple of examples of pictures that were made. As far as I can tell, nobody ever got anything useful out of it. Uh, but here's, I got interested in linkages. And you know, making constraints, I could make some linkages. I brought with me some of the original lantern slides. These are original photographs from the machine. And these maybe show, I don't know whether that shows better or For those of you who, who haven't seen lantern slides before, my father was fond of saying, let's have some limelight views. And you know, being in the limelight is an expression that means you're on stage. And I, I always wondered why that was, so I asked him. He was born in New Zealand in 1898, and before there was electricity, they got light for projecting slides of this kind by an acetylene flame on a piece of limestone. And that's the origin of the name limelight view. So, I brought these along just because they're antique, and some of you may never have seen a lantern slide before. I used to have a box of these I carried around to give this talk. You know. <laughs> Overheads hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> so anyhow, this was a little three-bar linkage. The middle bar is T-shaped, and it has a little dot on the top, which is making that funny pattern. And depending on the lengths of the different bars, the, uh, the linkage does various things. So the constraint, the constraint business made it possible to do that and make some crude animation. Here are some more examples. I defined some dimension lines. So here's a 3, 4, 5 triangle dimensioned. And of course, the dimension lines use the digits device and a constraint which makes the digits display the length of the line. So the 3,000, the 3, 4,000, and 5,000 things here are not things that I typed in. They're things that were computed from the drawing. The most interesting piece of things that I did was to make a constraint which attempted to retain the length of a line. So this constraint says this line is supposed to stay whatever length it is. And a scalar is constrained to represent the amount that it misses. And it turns out that because I use the least mean squares method of satisfying constraints, that's exactly what you want to do stresses in bridges if, in fact, all of the members of the bridge are the same kind of steel and the same size of beam. And so I made a bunch of these various bridge things, fastened a couple of points down, and then pulled on them with some kind of a thing here. So here's negative means tension. So here's 1,286, let's say, tons pull pulling on this bridge. And you can see how much force there is in all of the different elements of the bridge. That was kind of fun. Here's another example. I was asked to uh, say a little bit about where the ideas for Sketchpad came from. And where ideas come from is always an elusive, uh, an elusive subject. I asked Bob Sproul once where a particular idea came from, and he says, I think maybe water has something to do with it. Perhaps when water beats on the top of the head, you know, ideas are fresher. I don't know. <laughs> what I do know is that when I was in grade school, uh, I had to have my books covered. I don't know whether that was the practice when you were there, but we had to have covers over the books. And uh, mother never had plain brown paper, which I think I might have preferred. But what she did have was used blueprints that father had brought home from his civil engineering practice. And so the other kids all got plain brown paper, but I got blueprints. My books were always covered with blueprints. and so. Being bored in grade school, I used to try and puzzle out what these blueprints meant. So by the time I started high school, I could read blueprints without much difficulty. 
<laughs> and I had kind of gotten interested in mechanical drawing. And it may be that that had something to do about with this particular piece of work. Here's a couple more examples of pictures. I think maybe the thing to do at this time is to roll the movie and uh, have a look at the original Sketchpad movie. And then I'll make some comments about uh, some lessons that were learned from it. Now, I think I have to turn out the lights. David, will you do your thing, please? Wait, yeah, here we go. Here is another demonstration that I did once have hair. We'll now see the console of TX2. Oh, here was the paper tape reader that read, uh, read in the program that called the main program from, from, uh, from the magnetic tape. There was a wonderful sign on a, on a PDP-7, I think I saw one place, that said, if there are computers in hell, they will use paper tape. <laughs> This was a magnetic tape unit that had uh, about two million bits storage. It was addressable, so you could, it was like a drum in that regard, or a disc in that regard. There's the panel of toggle switches. You can see all the lights on the, uh, on the console. This film was made in May, on May 30th, Memorial Day weekend, but I don't know which year, probably 1992. And there I am drawing on the screen with the light pen in my right hand, and a set of push buttons there on the left with which I'm controlling various things. You see the knobs under the screen which control scale. Now we'll zoom in on the screen, and for the purposes of the movie, I remade the push button panel so that it sits here on the left of the screen. So you'll see my left hand pushing push buttons on the left hand of the screen, and here we are drawing lines. There's the little tracking cross for the light pen which appears to be coming out of the light pen as if it were a flashlight, but it's not. It's going in. Of course, you can erase lines, and one of the nice things was you don't get, you know, little crummy dust on your paper like you do with paper and pencil. Ink appeared whenever there was nothing else on the screen in order that the light pen could have some place to pick up the tracking cross. Here's drawing a circle. You'll notice that it's ignoring the radius of where I'm drawing from but in fact is using that only to control how much arc of circle to, to draw. You will see some flickering in this picture. Some of the flickering is due to interaction between the movie camera and the screen, and some of it is due to the computing time of the computer itself, and, and I'll try and distinguish those. The, the jumping that you see there is the computing time that's required to recompute the picture at a new scale. Turning the knob underneath the screen changes the scale. There you see clipping happening. Clipping had not yet been named. It was done, but not. There's a circle with several arcs. And you see there's just quite a lot of scale factor to be had. I used to describe this as, you know, big fleas have little fleas that bite them, and littler fleas have littler fleas, and so on ad infinitum. The fine detail is very fine detail indeed. Now here's a demonstration of the pseudo-gravity. So now notice the line will jump when I get near the existing line. See the line jumps over there so that the end point is exactly on the existing line. And if I do near the end point, it jumps also. And if I then terminate by that flick of the hand, those two lines have the same lower end point. And here's a third line attached to that same lower end point. So now if I move the end point, all three of the lines stay attached. And again, the flickering that you're seeing here is the rate at which the computer could keep up with what I was doing. A twelfth of a MIP ain't much computer power. You could also point at the intersection of two lines. When you pointed at endpoints, the topology of the drawing was established by what you did. When you pointed at intersections or terminated a line on another line, a set of constraints was set up which retained the notion that that line should terminate at the intersection. And the constraint satisfaction routine would move whatever it had to move in order to satisfy the conditions that you'd set up as you drew the drawing. That endpoint is really supposed to be at the intersection of those two lines. 
Now, this line is supposed to terminate at the intersection of the line and the circle. And so there's, or it's supposed to terminate on the circle. Now, there was, there was a, that was not a mistake. To point at the center of a circle, which doesn't otherwise appear, you point it slightly inside the circumference of the circle, and then by a, an artifice of the language, you were pointing exactly at the center. So that last line I drew is, in fact, a radius. And of course, again, you could erase nice and clean and tidy. Now here's applying constraints. I'm going to say that the left end of that short line should lie on this first line. It should also lie on the second line, and it should lie on the third line. And now if I satisfy those constraints, the three lines must have a common intersection. And indeed, that's the condition that I'd set up, and so there it is. Now if I move that same point to a fourth line and say it should also lie on the fourth line, then all four lines have to have a common intersection. Here's a bracket. And the idea, remember, was to draw the thing first and then fix it up. That's vertical. That's supposed to be horizontal, vertical, horizontal, vertical, and horizontal. Satisfying those constraints makes a much prettier looking bracket. And now a dotted line to represent a hole in the bracket. Draw a guideline first. Here's a guideline. And a second guideline for the other side of the hole. Those two lines should be vertical. Now let's draw a series of dots. And you'll notice in one of these, as I terminate one of these little dashes, I didn't flick quite hard enough. I think it's the middle one on the other side. And you'll see the line stuck, and I have to terminate it again. Here it comes. There it is. That flick of the hand was the termination signal. I raise the two guidelines, and there's a nice representation of a hole through the bracket. And I thought it might be interesting to put something in the hole. So this is now a picture. And a little later on, we'll see an instance of that picture. But for the moment, let's make another picture, which is intended to be a rivet. <clears throat> Here's a, what's going to be a rectangle with two diagonals. Use the intersection of the two diagonals as the center of a circle arc. And the circle arc is supposed to begin and end on that line, which should be horizontal, vertical, horizontal, and vertical. Satisfying all those conditions makes a reasonable looking rivet. Now, that's not the only solution to the set of constraints that I applied. So if I start with different initial conditions, we'll see a different shaped rivet where the pieces disappeared was the edge of the screen. That was the clipping. So here's a different situation that satisfies the same conditions that I applied. So I like the other one better. Let's go back to the longer, skinnier rivet. And now I'm going to make a picture which contains instances of the bracket and of the rivet. And again, the flickering that you see is, I don't know whether that's, that may be interaction with the movie film. So here we're going to slide the, uh, oh, we can change the size of instances and their rotation and their position. Four degrees of freedom for an instance. So just fitting that in by hand, there's no constraints being used to make the rivet fit exactly in the hole, just being fit in by hand. Here's another rivet. We can have rivets in any size that you want, any proliferation that you want. Let's go look and see how well the rivet fit in. Oh, if I make a change to the master drawing, you'll notice I erased the two diagonals. That change is reflected throughout. There was late binding here. Whenever an instance was displayed, the current definition was used rather than the definition that was applied at the time that it was called. Let's go examine the fit. Fit was not perfect, but it was, you know, just a demonstration toy anyhow. So uh, now let's call an instance of the picture, which is bracket plus rivet. 
we can have as many of those as we want, to within the computing power of a 1 12th MIP machine, and to within the storage capacity of a machine which had only a third of a megabyte, of which half was used simply to run the display. Now this is definitely the computing power. So you see the jumping there is gives you an idea of how fast the computer could recompute this picture, uh, computing the scaling and doing all of the line drawing, converting each line into a series of dots, recording those in memory, whilst one of the other sequences was busy displaying the dots that were in memory. Again, there was plenty of scale factor available. So we go and look at that little rivet there, and I think we put an even smaller one near it. Well, there was plenty of scale factor, but there's probably even more available now. And again, the flickering that you see there is the limitation of the computing power of TX2. TX2 was simply not a powerful enough computer. That doesn't seem to have changed in 30 years either. Now here's another example intended to suggest a different kind of drawing. This is a rectangle, and it has an attachment point there and another attachment point there, as if these were electrical terminals. Some constraints turn it into a proper rectangle. And here's a diamond, and this is a bug in the program. That's a bug, a bona fide program bug. Two attachment points, one at the top and one at the bottom of the diamond. Now let's use those as symbols. Imagine one of them is a capacitor and the other is a resistor, for example. So there's one and here's the other. And then we can attach lines onto the attachment points. An attachment point had adequate coordinates and constraints and so on so that it could be used as the termination for a line. That line is supposed to be horizontal, I'm saying, and that one's supposed to be horizontal. And the rotation and size of the instances was adjusted in order to satisfy the constraints. If you moved one of the objects, all of the topology of the wiring stayed correct so that you could, in fact, interpret the topological meaning of this drawing in some appropriate way. You could copy a symbol. So oh, give me another one of those, give me another one of those, and this time I'm going to attach the two attachment points directly to each other rather than having an intervening line. So this is attaching the, the attachment points, and the only way those conditions can be satisfied is for the two symbols to overlap. They really are supposed to be attached, and so satisfying constraints, they will be attached. Here's a little vertical line, the line, and now I tell it to be vertical. Not much happens, so I'm going to turn it so you can, you can see that that line I've drawn is really supposed to be vertical. Remember, the two symbols are supposed to be attached by their corner points, and the line is supposed to be vertical, so here's satisfying those constraints. And there was a paper tape punch, which made it one hell of a racket, and punched out paper tape at an incredible rate. You could, in fact, punch out a paper copy of your drawing and read it in later on. Uh, it was, you know, pretty straightforward. That's the end of that film, I think. I don't know, but it was an awfully good idea. <laughs> I mean, I got a lot of mileage out of this film, believe me. It is on videotape, and uh, we'll get a copy of it in inserted into this very lecture, so it'll be here also.
Here's a, another uh, example of a drawing that I made. I don't remember why. I'd like to talk a little bit about the lessons that were learned from Sketchpad. What do I need to do? Table back over to the middle. Well, you could make pretty drawings of the. You could make pretty drawings. The lines were straight. The circles were quite circular, and I found that rather satisfying. There was a was a problem in introducing users to this system, and the problem was that the topology of the drawing matters. You notice that when I drew three lines that were connected at a common point and then moved that point, all three of the lines moved. And the constraints that you put on the drawing were there, and the drawing would behave in different ways depending on what constraints you'd put on it. Lines had a beginning and an end, and the beginning and end were different. And it turns out that the line, in fact, was displayed from beginning to end, so you could see the dots crawling along the line, and the dots always moved in one direction. So unlike a you know, piece of dirt on a picture, which when you've drawn with a pencil, which doesn't do anything, these lines had a direction to them. Uh, the endpoints would stick together, and there was this funny distinction that I described between a constraint on the position of a set of digits and a constraint on the value of the set of digits. Well, I thought it would be interesting to try and teach Sketchpad to some folk who weren't programmers, and I rounded up some victims from around the Lincoln Laboratory, and it was hopeless. I mean, there was no chance. There was enough topology and enough sort of computerese in there that the naive users just couldn't or wouldn't learn. It was just not possible. So I think one of the lessons was sort of early on how hard it is to make computer stuff that folk who aren't computer literate can use. Maybe that problem will be self-fixing as the population as a whole becomes more computer literate, but I think it's still true today. Another lesson was that everything that you can put in the drawing had to have a representation on the screen because otherwise you couldn't erase it. In order to erase something, you had a point to it. And so the issue of what do things look like that don't ordinarily have an appearance? What does a constraint look like? Well, I invented this notation of a little circle with dotted arms that reach out to the things it's constraining. But it wasn't a very good notation. And in fact, the circles often overlapped, and so, you know, the circle appeared at the geometric center of wherever it was, and so they'd often overlap. And uh, it was a little hard to tell what the constraints were. And it was very hard to use the constraints wisely. It's awfully easy to over-constrain a situation or to under-constrain a situation, and then the drawing either reduces itself to a point or blows up or something, and you know, it was terrible. So the truth of the matter is that nothing useful was ever drawn except the thesis drawings that you've seen today. And uh, my mother wanted some hexagons. God knows why. So she got some hexagons. And here's how you draw a hexagon. You make a six-sided figure and then inscribe it in a circle by moving each corner onto the circle. And then you put on constraints that say the sides should all be equal. And then you erase the circle and you have a hexagon. And then you can stick the hexagons together by joining their corners. And that pattern is itself usable in multiple instances to make a hexagonal pattern. And so there's a hexagonal pattern. And my mother was delighted. <laughs> hey, who knows? Now, one of the things that I discovered in doing this, this may be the only piece of you know substantive stuff that I discovered, was that if you put half circles on a hexagonal array, you get what looks like scales. But I did that by changing the basic hexagon drawing. See, having laid the hexagons out, I could then redefine what the bottom level figure was to be a half circle, and bingo, we had scales. Here's the linkage of Poussalier. I guess in the 1800s, probably, there was a great question of how do you build steam engines? Because the problem is where the piston comes out of the steam engine, where the rod comes out of the cylinder of a steam engine, has to move in a straight line, but the crank wants to move in a circle. 
So they had sliders. They had what was called a crosshead, which used to slide back and forth. And people hated sliding joints. They said, couldn't we make a thing that was a linkage with all rotary joints that would nevertheless move in a straight line? And there was a great competition to see if any of the mechanical guys of the era could do that. And Poussalier was a Frenchman who won the competition. And this is his linkage. It has all of the elements in there are of length either one or length two. So the ratio of the lengths is obvious. And what I've done is to constrain a set of digits to tell you the distance between the left end of the dotted line and the vertical line. So the digits are displaying the length of the dotted line. And you can see for four different positions of Poussalier's linkage, at least for those four, sure enough, uh, the thing moves in a straight line. Now, there was a great mathematician by the name of Chebyshev. Remember Chebyshev's polynomials? Who, who recognizes Chebyshev's name? OK, well, he did a linkage. And what would you suppose Chebyshev's linkage did? Chebyshev's linkage was as straight a line as was possible, given that you used only a few links. Okay? I don't have a picture of Chebyshev's linkage, but you know, Chebyshev was always making these polynomials that fit as best you could in an interval. And so he did one which was a lot simpler than this, and which was almost a straight line. In fact, it was very good over a certain range. But uh, so I've come to the end of the Sketchpad talk, and I have a couple more slides which are called epilogue. What happened after this was all over? This is kind of a personal history, so I'll tell you what happened to me after all this went over. Well, I had been in the ROTC when I was an undergraduate, and so I went in the Army. The Army couldn't quite figure out what to do with an MIT computer PhD, and so it sent me two or three places and finally sent me to NSA, where, as one of my friends told me, they measured their computing power by the acre. At that time, there were two places that bought serial number one and serial number two of big computers. Livermore was run, and NSA was the other. And so I had a great time there. There was lots and lots of computers. and I. I defined a thing that we called the schooler display, which eventually got sold by DEC under the name the DEC 340. And then they sent me down to the Pentagon to run a piece of ARPA. And I ended up work, working for Bob Sproul's father, who at that time was the director of ARPA. And uh, I was a lieutenant in the service when I showed up in the Pentagon. They gave me $15 million and a secretary and said, go sponsor computer research. It's kind of an interesting job. But Bob's father uh, insisted that it be a closely guarded secret that I was in the service at all. And the reason was that I ran one branch of ARPA, and there was another military officer who ran another branch of, us, of ARPA, and he was a major general. And so General Winnicky and I used to go to staff meetings together. We'd sit side by side on the sofa in the staff meetings, and Bob Sproul's father would be running the staff meeting. And of course, General Winnicky always wore his uniform, and I never wore mine. And I used to call him Sir, and he used to call me Ivan, and we got along just fine. I don't think he was ever aware I was in the service. <laughs> there were a number of projects that that ARPA office paid for, and uh, Dave Evans had gone to UC Berkeley and, and started a computer science activity there which did some early work in time-sharing and produced a thing that was called the, the SDS 940, which was the 930 converted for time-sharing. Project MAC, of course, was the big time-sharing activity at MIT. That was sponsored out of my office. And at Stanford, there was a thing called the AI Project, which uh, I think had something to do with Andy Beckelshine's early training some years after I was in ARPA. <laughs> I think you can, uh, you can make the case that the ARPA Information Processing Office has more than paid for itself in terms of taxes returned by the companies and the employees thereof uh, that it has spawned. There's a huge number of companies come out of the research that that particular office has sponsored uh, over the years. 1966, I went and became a faculty member at Harvard University. The best thing that happened to me, I think, maybe in all my life was I met Bob Sproul, who's here today. Bob, hold your hand up, will you? Bob and I formed what's turned out to be a lifelong partnership, and it's worked very well for me ever since. We did virtual reality at Harvard. We didn't know it was called virtual reality, but we got interested in three dimensions and 
built a thing called the clipping divider. That's when clipping was named. It's called clipping because I named it. And I quite consciously chose a four-letter Anglo-Saxon word, which seems to have stuck in the vocabulary. We also thought in terms of windows on the screen that there could be more than one window on the screen which could display different information, and the word windows appears out of that particular work. Uh, 1968, I founded the Evans & Sullivan Company in Salt Lake City. Dave Evans uh, was going to come to Boston, and it was going to be a Route 128 company. And uh, I think he went home and talked to his wife about it, and she pointed out that he had seven kids and I had only two. <laughs> and so it was probably easier for me to move to Salt Lake than him to move to Boston, and that's why it's a Salt Lake company. At the same time, in 1968 to 74, I was part of the University of Utah graphics activity. There was a huge outpouring of graphics activity at Utah, due largely to the leadership of Evans, who said, we can't do all things for all people. We're going to do one thing and do it well. And a, a great many of the folk who subsequently went on to populate the, the various places that do good computer graphics work, Henry Fuchs, now at North Carolina, Jim Blinn, now at Caltech, uh, Frank Crow, now at Apple. Who else was there, Frank? Who have I missed? Catmull. John Warnick, now at Adobe. I mean, there was a, a nor I'm sorry, who else? Clark, Jim Clark, SGI. Guro. Guro, of Guro Smooth Shady. And it goes on and on. It was a wonderful time. We had a great time at the University of Utah. And then uh, Bob Sproul and Bob Schumacher and I published a paper called a characterization of 10 hidden surface algorithms, which said, hey, it's all a sorting problem anyhow. And that's when I left computer graphics. A friend, uh, friend of mine asked me if I knew anything about virtual reality. And I said, no, I don't know anything about virtual reality, but I have a book on it. And so I gave her this book to read. And when she got to page 88, this is what she found. <laughs> <laughs> I had hoped that we could get Alan Kay. Alan Kay is a great fan of Sketchpad. He's uh, probably the, the biggest advertiser of it. I hoped we could get him here today to, uh, to you know, make some commentary and do some of this epilogue for me, but he wouldn't come. So he did, however, send a piece of email around to his friends at Apple, and this is what it said. And I've come to the end of what I have to say, and I just want to remind those who are on the videotape <coughs> of the terms and conditions. Thank you all for coming. I guess I have to answer questions, right? <laughs> let's, uh, before I do that, let's let anybody who wants to go home, now is your time if you want to go home, because we'll be here for another half hour talking and answering questions. So no, no insults if you want to go at this point. What was the first question back here? Yes. <laughs> the font in the sketch pad drawings? Yeah, I did that. It was not. It was just, it was, all I had to work with was lines and circles, so I did, you know, whatever was straightforward. Frank. I know that some of the slides were much more complicated than what you probably like to look at on the screen, and I'm wondering how you made them. I assume they came out of the plotter. Yeah, they came out of the plotter, yeah. They were plotted. Did you put them together on the screen? Yes, indeed. I put them together on the screen and then plotted them. I'm sorry? We're zooming and panning. Yeah, zooming and panning and whatever. I mean, some of them were pushing the capability of the machine, and... I mean, a, a thesis at that time was something which filled memory twice. <laughs> <laughs> that, may not, that may not have changed either. I don't know. <laughs> Why are you laughing so hard, Bob? Did yours? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the back. No. Oh.
I see. I've been, I've been using Adobe Illustrator quite a lot recently, <coughs> and it has the same kind of pseudo-gravity that, that Sketchpad had. It has simplified, it's chosen to simplify its instancing mechanism so that when you make an instance, it is whatever, it's a copy of whatever the definition is at that time, which seems to be a lot easier for people to understand than leaving that structure for delayed binding. It's a nuisance when you define some kind of an array like the hexagons and want to change the elemental thing and see the effect in the array. But apparently that's, that's much less common in what real people want to do. I mean, programmers are always thinking delayed binding is wonderful. We put the binding off until the very last minute because, after all, we're programmers and we can remember that this is a definition and not the real thing and we know how to pass parameters and all that good stuff. But real people don't do that. I, I'm not surprised the company folded. I. Very interesting. I, I've been thinking maybe of reprogramming Sketchpad in C++. And I think it would not be hard. I have, in fact, the definition of what all the classes were. And so, in some sense, the specification is all done. It's just a matter of coding it up. And uh, the problem is there's always something else that has higher priority. You told yeah. me uh, uh, once that you yeah. didn't do constraints anymore because you thought they were too hard. Would you care to, do you still hold that view? And well, the constraint, there, there are two things that are hard about constraints. One was the constraint satisfaction programs were kind of tricky. And the ones you saw in the film, you'll notice that the, the line moved a step at a time. And what it was doing was basically a, a steepest descent search based on a least mean squares fit. And the least mean squares is easy to compute. That's, you know, straightforward. Um, so you can tell where you're targeted. And I put in the stepping because otherwise it tended to overshoot and moreover I couldn't see what was happening well enough to tell what was going wrong. And there were two methods in the thesis that I used. One was what I called the fast method, which made use of the topology to try and avoid having to do relaxation. So, for example, if, if the location of a point was constrained by only two constraints so that an exact position of that point could be computed, then we would postpone until last the computing of where that point should be. And many geometric constructions that you can do with ruler and compass have the property that if you start at the right end and simply do them, you always have the situation that the next thing you have to do is defined very clearly. And so I had a little topology hunter that would hunt for that kind of situation and remove from the kernel problem everything which was a trivial computation once I've solved the kernel problem. But there was always then the kernel that had to be solved. And that I did just by some relaxation process. And, and so the, the computation of the constraints was a bit tricky. But what was worse was figuring out what constraints you want. In order to get a certain result, you have to apply a certain set of constraints. And I, I think people are not very good at thinking about the elemental constraints in terms of the result. And so it's very easy to have not enough constraints, in which get you, case you get a picture like the rivet, which is the wrong shape, or to have too many in which there's no solution which satisfies all of the conditions. I've been working recently with trying to define constraints of sequence 
which are defined in an asynchronous computing machine. And we have a very crisp language for defining the constraints of sequence. This must happen before that, and this can only happen in the interval between A and B, and so on. And uh, as a result of a piece of code that David Dill wrote and Bob Sproul has, has improved since then, we can put those definitions into a system which will work out their implications and come up with a state diagram. And, and working up exactly the right set of sequence constraints to get a desired effect is exceedingly difficult because a small change in the constraints makes a big difference to the result. Now, that's both the good news and the bad news in the case of the sequence constraints. The bad news is it's hard to do. The good news is once you've done it, you've got it exactly right, and you know there's no more and no less than what you've said is required to get this resulting behavior. And that's very powerful in terms of them being able to, to design circuits that do what it is you want to do. So I, I, I kind of think that in the mechanical world, the constraint business is, is a tricky business just from the point of view of understanding what they mean. Now, there was a nice thesis done at Carnegie, Bob. Who was it who did it, the algebraic thing? Is who? Michael Gleischer. Well, there's some work been done now to, to algebraically look rather than just using the relaxation method. But it was a long time after I did this before somebody else had courage enough to attack the constraint problem. It's a tough problem. And you know, what, what seems to have been my fate in life is to do things sort of not quite right, but you know, 10 years before anybody else had courage to try. And, and hey, that's a role, you know. But, <laughs> but it basically means that nothing that I've done works very well. You know? <laughs> yeah. First one I noticed because um, a few days ago I went to a talk Randy Pausch gave on virtual reality, and one of his key points was an architecture where the uh, update of the geometry based on the tracker was done in one place and fast, so you could get 15 frames a second as you moved your head, and that was decoupled from the simulation of whatever you were looking at. So maybe the billiard balls only go at four frames a second in the world you're in. And he uh, put this forth as a very important principle that would be there no matter what the horsepower was as things sped up. And I think it has to do with decoupling things that have to do with human response time from the limits of the computation for simulation. And in your film, going backwards in time, I noticed that the crosshair of the light pen was tracking much faster than the rubber band lines you were drawing. And uh, I suspect that somehow you, you ended up with a system where the crosshair had to track the pen fast so that you know your, your perceptual systems would work and you could coordinate the darn thing. But whatever you were doing with geometry and drawing, that could go slower. So it was a really interesting sort of backwards validation of this principle. Well, you're, you're, you're precisely right. The pen tracking routine came on 60 times a second through an interrupt clock. And it had to, because otherwise the pen might have moved more than one pen diameter in the interval between tracking crosses, in which case it would be lost. Just incidentally, I always thought of the pen tracking as a servo mechanism. And years after I did this work, Tom Stockham pointed out it is not a servo mechanism at all because the coordinates that are computed as a result of the tracking cross are independent of where the tracking cross is placed, provided the tracking cross is seen by the light pen at all. So I had a predictive pen tracking mechanism, which if the pen was moving at you know, one inch per 60th of a second or something, it would guess the pen is probably going to be there, and it would drop the tracking cross there. And as long as the tracking cross was seen at all, the, the tracking cross would feel out the edges of the field of view of the light pen. And then on the basis of the top and bottom and left and right edges, and since it's a circular field of view, it would compute the exact center of where the pen was. So there's a total decoupling between the measurement you get back and the initial location of the tracking cross. And it's not a servo mechanism. I, I was surprised when Tom explained that to me. So I, I have a different observation, which, which was I think of this boy growing up, father does blueprints, looking at the blueprint embodiment of you know, the father he loved. 
goes to MIT, gets a, a vector scope that can draw lines. And I looked at the film and I saw you solving problems that blueprint makers had, like the scaling. Well, I can see it being a real problem with blueprints that you can't get a big enough sheet of paper to draw the whole bridge or, or fine enough detail to draw the subassembly and getting the lines all to line up. And I'm wondering if I'm reading too much into that or if a lot of the particular things you did at first had to do with uh, sort of making a better blueprint, uh, you know, drafting table. And then all this stuff got used for a whole bunch of other stuff besides that. Well, perhaps. I, I think what I felt was the discovery part of this was the discovery that there was, in effect, a computer between what I held in my hand and the drafting surface. And the idea that I could put computing power between where I moved my hand and what the picture was was what was the powerful idea. The notion of rubber band lines, for example, is not something a draftsman would use. And that was a discovery. That came as a surprise. Okay, I mean, as I thought about how am I going to do this, that's sort of what emerged. I, I can't say that I sat down and said, this is the way it's going to be ab initio. Okay, I think I tried two or three other things first, but I quickly came to the notion that the rubber band lines seemed a useful way, and it seemed easier to do that than making a trail of carbon on the back of where a pencil went. <coughs> so in part, you're right. But I think when one does that, which is all one can do, is sort of extrapolate from where we are now. But when one does that, often there's discovery. It's different when you get out there, when you have more computing horsepower, when you have a better something or other, when you, whatever it is you can do, you, you find some discoveries of, of the ways it's different. And it seems to me that seeking ways of thinking about things that are not the conventional ways of thinking about things is one of the ways of doing creative work. And it's very hard. It's very hard to abandon one's preconceived notions of what a drawing is or what a, and so on. Your vocabulary kind of ties you in. Back there. No, I don't think it did. I mean, it was clear that computers were exciting. And you know, I didn't do this with any great commercial expectations. I did it because it was fun. I mean, it really was fun. And I had this whole enormous computer all to myself. I mean, it was online use of computing when hardly anybody got that. It was my own personal computer. Now, admittedly, it was only from 3 to 5 AM, OK? <laughs> but you know, I was willing to get up at that. And, and you know, some, some of us would have made that the day before. I made it the day after, so. <laughs> Okay, I had had a full night's sleep and got started early in the morning. And I was willing to do that because it was very exciting. Wonderful fun. Yes? Do you want to take a big clock for doing what might be received as a over simplistic sequence or anything like that? You know, one of, the, one of the very good pieces of fortune I had was that my thesis supervisor was impeccable. Okay? And moreover, he didn't want any of the credit. He had plenty of credit already, OK? I mean, you know, he invented switching theory for his master's thesis, and he did information theory for his PhD. And you know, he, he didn't need anything. So, so you know, he may have gotten flack. I certainly didn't, OK? And at, and at that time, the notion of using pictures for computing, this was exciting stuff. And it was the best stuff in the country. And so people were interested in saying, oh, gee, you know, rather than, oh, that's too simple. They said, I didn't know computers could do that. Can you comment on the pressing projects? Of course, you can use the computer from the tree. The pressing projects were mostly folk who were older than I was. <laughs> uh, some 15 years later, I asked Wes Clark why he built the TX2. And he said, I built it for you. <laughs> it was a very nice thing for him to say. But Yes. How big was the whole sketchpad system? <coughs> Bytes or words or whatever? Well, it filled memory. Half of memory was the display file. A bit of memory, some of memory, maybe you know, a sixth was the topology. So that accounts for 40,000 words. So there's about 20,000 words of code. 
which is in those days would be about 20,000 instructions, except it was a macro assembler, so it was fewer than that lines of code. It was probably 10 or 12,000 lines of code. No, but I have the listing itself. I have the printout on paper, and, uh, and it's, it's almost legible. It's printed on a Xerox printer, uh, not the kind you know today, not a laser printer. It was a uh, laser hadn't been invented then either. Uh, <laughs> That's not quite true. The laser had been the laser had been invented, but it was a Caratron tube, which then printed with a xerography mechanism. And I remember there was a, a steel wastebasket beside the printer in case the fusing heater uh, should start the paper on fire. If the paper got stuck, it would create a fire. So there was this thing with a metal lid. You could throw the burning paper in and put the <laughs> lid on. Uh, wonderful stuff. There had been two such printers built for, by Xerox for Lincoln, and one was kept in the closet as a spare. So, you know, if there was... Yeah? I'm sorry? Yeah, he did. He came out to Lincoln on a couple of occasions. Not, not very often. He was, he was wonderful fun to work with. He, uh, he was a balanced nut. And he just loved the balance. He rode a unicycle, and he could do a tightrope like nobody's business. And uh, Huffman was also a balance nut. Huffman of Huffman Coding was a professor at MIT at that time. And I remember one time, uh, Russ Pfeiffer, now dead, was an office mate of mine. And Russ Pfeiffer brought to the office a, a space pistol the damnedest thing I ever saw. It had a hemispherical plastic front with a hole in it. On the back of that, there was a diaphragm. And there was a plunger with a rubber front and a spring. And when you pulled the trigger, the plunger went and struck the diaphragm, which then caused a vortex to come out of the front of the thing. And you could blow out a candle on the far side of the room. It was amazing. I mean, you have a candle burning over there. If you aimed carefully, you went bang. And the vortex traveled quite slowly. And then the candle would go out. Okay? I mean, it was amazing. Okay? And I remember Huffman stuck his head in the office one day and said something about kids playing with toys, at which point the candle went out. And his eyes got big, and he said, let me see that. <laughs> now, I wouldn't know chapter two, except that Huffman happened to be Bert's neighbor in Lexington. And I am told by good authority that chapter two involves a 55-gallon oil drum and a sledgehammer. <laughs> And on, a, and on a winter day, if you went for a walk in the woods behind Huffman's house, you were likely to get a load of snow dropped on you <laughs> from a vortex that went in the field. <laughs> now, one of, the, one of the things about technology is it's very much a, a people game. And uh, Shannon, I'm told, was uh, also, he also wrote a pogo stick. And my informant from Bell Labs said one day Shannon was riding his pogo stick down the hall in Bell Labs. <coughs> You know, hop, hop, hop. Now, a pogo stick, you recall, has a spring in it. So at the top of the, the flow, there is a certain amount of potential energy of gravity, which is then converted into kinetic energy as you fall. And then as the spring is compressed, it's converted into potential energy and the compression of the spring and back into kinetic energy of motion and then potential energy of gravity and so on. Shannon was riding his pogo stick down the hall in Bell Labs, I'm told. And I uh, came to the stairs, and he started going down the stairs. Okay. <laughs> now, as you realize, the top of the jump will remain at the same height because the potential energy is the potential energy. <laughs> and so what happened as the stairs fell away from Shannon <laughs> was Shannon's head was getting closer and closer to Now, I think a lesser man might have been killed, and my informant said, my god, we've lost a national asset. But uh, Shannon, I think, analyzed the physics as quickly as you did, maybe quicker, and came back <laughs> up the stairs. <laughs> maybe with that, we should come to an end. Let's go home.